Welcome to Mavericks, a program specially designed to showcase great leaders, business magnates, and exceptional people who have been exceptionally good in their chosen field of endeavor. And today we have with us an exceptional person in the field of accounting and accounting standards, a council member, past president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, a past managing partner of Ernst & Young, a friend and a lovely human being, Manil Jaisinghe. Manil, welcome to the program. Thank, thank you, Niroshan. And uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to sort of uh, be with you. <coughs> it's lovely to have you. Um, I have watched you from afar um, at different forums, how you've led the think tanks and the thinking behind good practices in finance, governance, and business. So today, we will probably deep dive into a few thoughts that might help the business community. But before we do that, i love to know your journey. As a child, as a kid, what type of person you are, and how you've come up to where you are today. Thanks, Niroshan. <coughs> So it has been a long journey, as you as you know. Uh, actually, my initial uh, life, I was not really focused on accounting. My passion was really engineering. Okay. Uh, and uh, from my very small days, <coughs> I used to get involved uh, with a lot of things, which which re revolved around engineering. <coughs> Still, uh, that passion is there, okay. <laughs> even though I'm doing accounting. Uh, I think <clears throat> over the years, that has helped me also to sort of understand accounting better. Because at the end of the day, accounting is about uh, communicating what businesses have done. And if you have to understand the business, you have to deconstruct and understand what the business is all about. <clears throat> So that, that has been always my passion and uh, direction. Uh, unfortunately for me, uh, uh, in my early years, uh, there was some disruption in my education. Also, I was in Sri Lanka, then I moved to UK for a couple of years and then came back. So there was some disruption and <clears throat> once I came back in a couple of years, I joined Ernst and Young. So out of uh, nearly 40 years, I have spent at Ernst and Young. So, so that is really the journey. Um, uh, when I joined Ernst & Young, believe it or not, I didn't have anything, not even accounting. I was only doing my <coughs> A-levels at that time. Uh, so that's how the passion for accounting grew. And I think that combination of uh, uh, that uh, when you're doing engineering, I believe you have this analytical thinking, uh, analytical thinking together with accounting probably had a good match. Okay. And uh, that's probably how I uh, moved more towards even in accounting, the more the technical side than uh, the general uh, accounting part. Were you a sports person? Were you a musical yes. person? Uh, I was uh, somewhat sports. Uh, uh, I never really uh, played for my school because I think when we are in school, we, we, we were not given too much time and studying, studying, studying was the thing. But uh, when, when I went to England, I started uh, playing cricket. And then when I got back, I played, uh, continued to play cricket for Ernst and Young as well. And uh, <coughs> we uh, managed to go up the chains because we used to play mercantile, D division, C division, and ultimately ended up in B and then came down. <laughs> so, so I used to uh, play cricket and uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, not the way, current stature of mine, but uh, in the past I was an opening bowler, <laughs> not really a uh, spin or whatever it is. So uh, I used to open for Ernst and Young, uh, and then we we had a great team and we we won several accolades over the years. So so cricket was one of my passions anyway. Uh, I do love sports, but uh, unfortunately 
time doesn't permit me to do to get too involved in it. Because you said you spent 40 years, 40 good years at Ernst and Young, like almost like a second family. I was just um, thinking, many I meet today tell me that you had to be in a company for five years and you had to move on, so on and so forth. This, this discussion has its merits for and against. What is your feeling of working with an organization for 40 years? Yeah, so it's, it's all about the passion for the job and not necessarily, uh, uh, I would say, economic or commercial benefits. Uh, well, of course, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to detract from that, that is also a key part, but I think more about the passion. And uh, for me, though, I spent 40 years within the firm, there has been continuous change. Uh, so like, say for example, uh, my real strength is in auditing and if you looked at auditing, the, 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 the technology in auditing, the methods that you adopt, all that kept changing every so five years or six years, this keeps changing. So over the 40 years I have seen so many things change, you know. So even though it's the same entity, uh, entity kept on reinventing itself, you know, and, and uh, changing. Also, one good thing about Ernst and even with the people, people also change. So it's like new entity every so often, it gets kept on getting refreshed. Because we are anyway a service organization, which means people are the key, key factor. So that environment is like you keep changing jobs. Because what you had two years ago, probably the people have changed, everything has changed. Uh, methodologies have changed, the way you approach things have changed. Uh, so. So that kept me going and uh, frankly, uh, though I'm in accounting, I could never see myself as a, a finance, financial controller or finance manager because I think that's boring. <laughs> but what I did kept on improving. Uh, new, new things come, new standards come, new ways of looking at things come out, uh, new technologies. Uh, so when, when, when I started, you know, computers was, uh, a huge thing in Sri Lanka for you to have a computer meant uh, it's a big thing, you know, no one had. I went into that field as well, automating our processes, uh, automating our business within the firm. Uh, so I doubled a little bit on that also. And uh, so, so it, 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 it continuously evolved. Right. And I think it will continue to do so. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, when you were at Slefa, I think. Uh, you know, in the Southeast Asian region, you got the opportunity to see what's working out in the region, what's not. Yeah, so so we, uh, as a firm, uh, we, we were on our own for a long time, though we were part of Ernst and uh, uh, Young. But then the global firm started to uh, redefine itself and became like a single, uh, moving towards a single practice. And invariably that happened, uh, so with that, we ended up being with uh, previously, uh, uh, yeah, we ended up being in Asia Pacific. So, so therefore, regularly there are uh, discussions about how things are moving, how uh, uh, changes, different practices. So you are exposed to all this, mm -hmm. uh, different people, different cultures. Uh, so much so, like even, um, uh, even. Uh, some, some time back they wanted to see whether I would like to go into the region and I said no, I, I think I have enough things to prove in Sri Lanka, I don't really need to go into the region. But we draw a lot on their experience, expertise uh, and then that collaboration I think makes us a truly a, a international sort of uh, firm as well. Of course. And something that um when I talk to most finance people or of that discipline, they constantly talk about your contribution and value towards accounting practices uh, and the technicality of it. Um, how do you see yourself in that particular so sphere uh, of work? I think as I mentioned to you, uh, so, so to get back, I, I believe that uh, you know, language of any business is accounting. So you you know you can you can be in any field you can be uh, an engineer you can be a uh, uh, marketeer you can be uh, anything but at the end of the day when it comes to communicating what you have done 
it's via accounting that you do so. Okay. Uh, say marketing guys sometimes uh, say, you know, I have done a great thing. Uh, I have brought in so much of revenue, so many customers. Uh, true, but who tells you that you have brought in so much of revenue, so much of customers? So it is accounting discipline that that uh, that converts your actions and then reports it uh, to the general public as to what you have achieved. So that that's accounting. A lot of people don't understand that, and uh, therein lies the problem. So accounting is not really a very uh, you know, take a set of books or maintain it or whatever it is. It's it's trying to see whether that, that tells the story of what the entity has done. So that is something that I sort of figured out some time back. Mm -hmm. And even though I do double in the technical side of accounting, uh, one of the things I feel that we as accountants need to probably do is to make people understand this technical stuff is only to help you to, to, to relate that story, but in a manner which is consistent with everyone, whether you do it or I do it, we come and show the same picture. Mm. Now, the difficulty would be if you do it your own way, I do it my own way, then how does a third party figure out that both, we may both be doing the same thing, but communicating in different ways. So, in order to bring that communication uh, to some commonality, is where this technical stuff in accounting uh, comes through. Uh, so, so I have always felt that, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy technical because as I told you, I, I, I try to go to the root and try to deconstruct it and figure out why it is there. Mm. And uh, I think that helps me probably to relate better to the market uh, and uh, try and if there is difficulties in understanding try to try to show them that it is not too difficult but this is all about uh, basic rational or logical thinking and then uh, you'll get the same answer uh, so a lot of fear and uh, doubt you have is due to the fact that people don't understand and uh, unfortunately accounting is such that our accountants also tend to think that in a discussion that the other person understands what you are saying and not necessarily uh, try to come down to their level and explain it in their language so that they understand what we are trying to say. So that has been one of the biggest challenges over the years that I have seen uh, and uh, I think uh, when you also think of accountants you have a negative, I am sure you have a negative uh, uh, connotation or negative feel because they you feel that accountants are generally people who say no to everything, <laughs> try to try to curtail everything. But uh, the, the, the issue is that they have a reason for doing that. It is like because they are they are the guardians of the, 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 the assets and uh, guardians of the entity. So they try to play that role. Uh, but I still think you can play that role. The other person must understand where you are coming from. Sure, sure, absolutely. I think it was probably um, many, many years ago, I was at an annual conference of the Charity Institute of Accountants and the guest speaker spoke about business partnering. Today it's a common word everybody uses, but he turned around and said um, in the next 10 to 15 years, there won't be any accountants. In a room full of accountants, everybody just looked at the speaker and he said, no, no, not that the accountant job uh, won't be there, but the role that they will play in August, which is very close to what you're talking about. So the, if you look at our, uh, let's say if you want to say the curriculum or the, the discipline that we are doing, uh, it, it moves from basic uh, record keeping uh, and ensuring that those records reflect what the business is doing to really contributing to how the business is run. Unfortunately, our professionals tend to move towards the record keeping part and not really move towards the, what I call the real accounting. Uh, that's where the problem comes. So if you are in the record keeping phase, going forward, uh, AI, uh, digitization will knock those jobs out. So World Economic Forum also talks about the jobs at risk and accounting is standing right up there. <laughs> <laughs> Accountants and auditors are supposed to be right up there. Okay. Uh, but the issue there is they are, I feel that they are focusing more towards the 
the, the, the routine stuff. But accountants are really not uh, trained only in that. That is only to my mind uh, the basic stuff so that you understand how you deliver on the value. So accountants, uh, if, if you are a CEO, you would want the accountant to be in your right hand in order for that business to be successful. And if you go back, many of the successful businesses have had that combination. It is a good, uh, as you call it, a partnership. So if you have that partnership, I think you will be very successful. But unfortunately, uh, most of uh, our accountants, uh, they, they, I think, shy away from the value creation part and they are more comfortable in the routine part. So we need to sort of move away from that, use our knowledge and skill and in order to help businesses to, to, to differentiate themselves in the marketplace and to, to thrive in the marketplace. And then there the accounting has a big role to play because today as you can see even in Sri Lanka, uh, some of these things, why has it got into such a mess, uh, take the CEB or the Yes, there are the political issues as to pricing and all that, but I, I always say even in, uh, in, in risk management, see if the accountants can articulate the impact of it, not to say no, uh, but in order to highlight the risks that are there in doing something, then the other person has to, or the managing director, whoever has to figure out, okay, can, can we uh, bear the risk, tolerate it, or can we overcome that risk? So if you cannot, then it has to be that that's the road that you should not be taking, right? If the risks are way, way higher than any benefits that one can uh, obtain. So that is where the problem is. So like, I think uh, long years ago, this is an old story, but uh, the, the, the Sony Corporation, I think a chairman or someone mentioned uh, that if you listen to the accountant, the Walkman would have never hit the roads, okay. right? Uh, yes, because they would have done their NPV calculations and whatever it is and said, no, this is not a viable viable answer. But all of this is based on uh, assumptions and uh, uh, it's, it's about predicting the future. So, so you need to probably articulate to the guys and say, okay, this is success is based on certain factors. If you can achieve those, uh, then you will succeed. If you cannot achieve them, then you will fail. So, it's about identifying those critical elements or success factors and articulating the other person, uh, uh, do you think we can take this risk or do you think this risk will get minimized as we go forward? Um, so that is I think where the, the, the image of the accountants have become uh, rather negative uh, because of their role. Uh, it is like uh, because you have been trained to be very conservative, you have been uh, trained not to take risks. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is necessary because if every fellow starts taking risks, no one is going to safeguard yourself, right? So it's it's a balance that we are trying to achieve, and not necessarily uh, one way or the other. Sure. And as I have so many CEOs um, with us in this forum, I just thought to myself for a moment: they are the business leaders of the past who probably were less qualified. I don't think they are less educated probably had the Liana Mahatya, who today is the financial controller, right by, them, right by that side, uh, giving them advice, going to the sites, checking out, coming back and talking. That's the partnership you are talking about. Yes. So, so, so like, uh, actually one of the areas that I, I, I feel this country, uh, to some extent, fails, is uh, developing our SMEs, right? So, one of the problems with an SME is that, these guys are good entrepreneurs. They know the business, they know how to make it run. But they are very poor in their manager, uh, financial management skills. So I, I feel that these two have to meet. And if you don't, uh, you'll have many failures in the uh, SME sector, which we do. Uh, recently, I don't know, someone sent me a clip and uh, this guy was giving a talk in some international forum and he was saying, uh, 80% of startups fail in the first few years, mm. 80%, yeah. that's a huge failure rate. That's right. So, the, the cost of that failure 
the general society is bearing. Mm -hmm. uh, now you might ask how, but it does because through the banking system, through the financial system, they, they do bear. So if you can reduce that in some form or the other, bring it more closer to even 50%, I'm sure the countries will benefit a lot. So that's I think where accounting and everything helps. So like, uh, like a lot of people say, uh, okay, we, we, we start a business and we start moving and then all of a sudden the business suffers from cash flow problems. Why? Because they have not managed their debtors or working capital or whatever the case may be and then they have cash flow problems. And when you have cash flow problems, you're dead. That's the final nail in the coffin, <laughs> right? So, uh, that's where the accountants can come and help them to streamline that process, uh, give them information uh, of how, how that cash flow needs to be managed. Sure. So I think that's where we, we, we are failing in some form or the other meaning. Today, uh, even if you take our country, my personal view, we are in this mess because we have poor financial management. Because we, 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 we in the last decade or so, we, when we moved away from uh, low income country to a middle income country, we lost certain, um, how should I say, uh, uh, access to certain types of uh, resources as well as uh, yeah, main resources. We didn't take that and put it into the new circumstance in, in going forward. So for example, the simple thing I would say is that so we went and invested in assets which which were long term assets like say you go and put a highway which the return will come maybe over 25 years and we funded it with a 5 year loan or a 10 year loan. So what do you think is going to happen? You are waiting for a disaster to take place, right? Because at the end of the 10 years, meaning you would have not generated enough cash flows to pay off the loan. So then we are looking at at the end of the 10 years either going for another loan or getting some form of financing, otherwise you're never going to settle the old one off. So that's where I think we we had a problem, and uh, today we can see the repercussions of it. So I feel that part of it is uh, poor financial management, part of it is our reluctance to embrace change. So we change from one state to another state, but we never understood what that state is all about, and. Uh, we happily went along doing the same thing. Whether the new state allowed us to do the same thing, no one checked. And then here we are. As a past president of uh, the Charity Institute of Accountants, you've seen the academia working on some of these areas within the field. What suggestions, if you possibly could have? Because when you took over, it was also a difficult time period, COVID and so many things. But you're still in the game. <laughs> what more do you think we can do in, in, in the teaching aspect of these students? So, so th there are several things that has to happen. Uh, unfortunately, the time I took over the institute, uh, we had COVID and uh, things became difficult. But uh, saying that, it, it derailed some of the things that uh, I wanted to push forward. A uh, few things that I mentioned was SOE reforms was one of the areas that I mentioned uh, in my uh, inauguration as well. Uh, we couldn't focus on this because we were firefighting, trying to see how we can get out of COVID and not. So that period also brought about a lot of technical issues, so which we resolved hopefully during that time. And we, we kept on moving, but some of the areas, the development areas, got a bit, uh, how should I say, pushed back. Uh, so one of the areas was this SMEs. So 52% of our economy is SMEs. 52%. And about 70% of our GDP is given by the SOEs. So these, if these, we are not focused on these two as a country, we can't move forward. Uh, so on the SME front, uh, what we started was this whole equation about partnering. You mentioned the, about partnering. So they are, what we said is, you know, you, you can't go to an SME and tell the SME, hire a consultant to tell you how to run your business. Never going to work, in my view. But if that if that finance guy can partner with the entrepreneur and together they, they run that business, uh, the entrepreneur knows the business, they know how to get going, these guys will, you know, put the necessary brakes. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a racing car going on a track. 
without breaks. What's going to happen? Are you going to win the race or end the race? Not going to happen. So you need to know when to apply the brakes, mm. when to slow down. So that's the, the role in my view of a finance guy. So if you don't know that, uh, you can be rest assured you'll crash somewhere. Right? So that's, that's one aspect. From the accounting profession aspect, I still feel that the future, there are few things that we need to do. One is, as I mentioned to you, we need to build our skills up. So in, in, in a person applying brakes, would you, don't you think it's better for that person? Say for example, if you are in a bus and you are taking passengers, if the passengers know when the brakes are going to come, the passengers become ready uh, to, to take that jolt or whatever it is, right? The passenger is taken unawares, what's going to happen to the passenger? The passenger is going to knock the fellow in, in front or you will have to rely on a seat belt or something like that, right? So in the same way, so the accountants also need to learn how to communicate. And then that I feel is one of the weaknesses we have. Uh, when I say communication, a lot of people misunderstand me to say that it's language. Language is part of communication in my view. Communication is a much bigger, a much bigger area, right? So they, they need to develop as to how to articulate how to, they call the negotiation skills, yeah. how to negotiate, how to, you know, reach that balance. So that's the communication part is a critical factor. So in this you will have things like emotional intelligence and things like coming into play. Uh, that's one area. Uh, the, 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 I believe the second area is going to be uh, ESG, which is this environment, social and governance aspect of it. Uh, world is going to move a lot in that area because our younger people today they are more worried about the future of the planet rather than they are worried about themselves. So given that trend, uh, I think that's going to be one area that's, that's uh, going to move. And uh, the, the third factor is I think things like AI development in the communication, the, the communication fields, you know, like the internet and whatnot. Uh, it's going to change the dynamics of a lot of professions, not only accounting, but a lot of professions. Uh, I think some people feel threatened by it. Uh, I feel there is huge opportunities. Uh, yes, there will be a component that is threatened, that is really, I told you, the bookkeeping side. Yeah, of course, they will be threatened. But the only thing, there are a lot more opportunities. AI will help you in your decision making. If you use it properly, uh, you should be able to come to better decisions. Uh, better analysis and hopefully better businesses. Yeah. So that's where this whole piece sits. Yeah. So it's not about getting threatened, it's about uh, changing the way you use these and making and, and making sure that you use them to the best benefit. Sure. So that's where I feel uh, we will end up being. So accountants also will have to uh, not be threatened by being challenged by the new opportunities created. Sure. So uh, there will be, uh, as it's today also, there is a lot of scope for data, data analysis, data sciences. Uh, yes, AI will do a lot of it, but you have to also remember, uh, this is my personal view, uh, you have to also remember, you know, we have had autopiloting in the world for a long time, but we still can't get an automatic car going, right? Self-driven cars, still we are finding it difficult. Uh, what I have analyzed is it is the unpredictability of the human being. So AI really develops on, on historical data and then it puts a layer of, you know, sort of a prediction type of an engine, right? But the prediction engines also work on historical data. So there will be some time before AI can think equally as a human being. Now human brain has the ability to quickly change and, 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 and react to new situations. It will be a long time before AI gets that. Yeah. Right? So, so I think that's why I'm saying I'm not necessarily threatened by it, but I think you have to learn how to use it for the benefit of the, uh, the any organization or anything like that. I think that's well said because any change that has happened, anything from moving from since you spoke about vehicles, manual gears to automatic gears, which was itself difficult, um, to many other things, if not self-driven vehicles, we've always been reluctant, saying loss of jobs, loss of economy. 
And I think that's the politics of the world than anything else that's taking over. I can't think of a better person because you're also well traveled. What's happening in the world? We sit in Sri Lanka and think only our politicians can't get this country sorted, while you know you have an indictment of the current president uh, of America and, and, and past president of America, and so many things are happening. Mm. What's happening? No, I think politics in any country is the same. <laughs> Maybe in our case we are a little bit more crude and we have this corruption and all that things that is happening. But I, I feel in any country, politics means there are, uh, how should I say, pressure groups which drive politics. You know, I hear in, in America, still there is a tobacco lobby. Now, otherwise someone can ask, why isn't tobacco banned, for example? Not that I'm saying for any, any time it should be banned, but if you look at all the negative sentiments that have been expressed about tobacco, and then you, you sometimes tend to wonder with such a lot of negativity, how come it is one of the most thriving industries, right? So, this, this is all about politics as well. So, wherever it is, politics is an issue. Today, we have uh, the, the problem with the politics is it, it has to play on the people and it has to play on the the sentiments of people and in most countries the general population uh, do not do deep analysis they take things as to what they can see so that's therein lies the problem so so the world i think is going through a tough time uh, personally i feel the planet is overcrowded uh, the, 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 with that overcrowding and that consumer behavior you know, you have to come to a point where it, it tapers off. You know, in the growth phase, it's fine, everything grows, right? But then, can you grow forever and ever? It has to slow down at some point, and we are seeing some parts of it, that impact of slowing down taking place now. Uh, for the last several years, people are predicting a recession, but this recession is not coming because people are doing some fixes and keep going. Uh, one of the issues, if you look at historically the world, every so often, some calamity has happened. You have World War One, World War Two then some great depression, some calamity has happened. And that has balanced the, what I call the population a bit, right? <laughs> that now with development in the medical sciences, development in various things, maybe even negotiation skills, these things have been averted to some extent. And, and uh, uh, so those disasters haven't taken place. And when you don't have those, I think that rebalancing doesn't take place. So that I feel is one of the issues that we are having. Uh, so, so I, I don't know how long we we'll continue like this, but there is a lot of challenges whether it's in Sri Lanka or in the world now. Uh, our economy also, we said that we will start coming out of it, you know, but it's slow. Why? Because the Western European countries are now having problems. So our main trading partners are there, and uh, now they are having difficulties. That's that is really will hamper our recovery. So, so the, the issue here is we, we are, uh, this is where I think uh, some degree of scenario analysis has to come in. We plan for the future based on what we know today, but we do not factor in the changes that can happen in the environment. So, if you do that changes, like say for example, uh, if you take the garment industry for example, right? Uh, in the, in 21, 22 and all that, they were having a fantastic time because people were overbuying. Not that the consumers were overbuying, but the channels were overbuying. Why? Because they didn't want a stock out situation coming. Now, if one really looked at it and looked at the consumer demand, one had to come to a conclusion that at some point, this is going to slow down, not because consumer behavior has slowed down, because you have gone and uh, stuffed the channels. But I don't think anyone sort of forecasted that. So they went on happily saying, ah, good, no, we, we are selling more, we can, they probably went and added production facilities also. So these are the things I think one has to do a deeper study and, and, and come to conclusions, uh, which I feel a lot of places don't do. They don't do that uh, analysis or the, uh, the, the, the scenario planning or whatever it is. And uh, that's why sometimes they, we, we are used to reacting to uh, what I call firefighting, mm -hmm. rather than being uh, 
more uh, futuristic and try to see uh, right sort of try to play out and see what scenarios require what action that part doesn't necessarily happen that well uh, a lot more to improve in that part and then those are areas where i think things like ai will help you know, I, I still think people keep talking about these technologies but it's not really happening I mean, simple thing like our agriculture have we ever used ai on agriculture now i'm not saying to knock the farmer off and i'm saying we can if ai can help us to predict weather patterns ai can help us to more accurately uh, yeah determine weather patterns we can accurately determine uh, the fertilizing cycles we can accurately determine uh, maybe crop uh, like you know like pests uh, pests and things like that so we are not doing that no and yet the technology is already done exactly it's made exactly so why are we not doing it <laughs> so my my point is as i said you see you for me it's a huge uh, potential that these technologies have but i don't think we have learned the art of using it mm. sometimes i feel and this may sound drastic are we living a lie we print money we talk of uh, environment and spend more money uh, on the discussion of environment than anything else are our banks safe are our people safe just a general comment it's a bit of a near side no is in anything what happens is there is the the, the short term and then there is the medium term now in the short term sometimes we have to do some unpleasant things like you know print money and all we have to because we have to survive the short term right uh, they, but the, the the danger in that is you do the short term but without really thinking about what is going to happen in the medium now you have to blend these two so then okay even printing money probably might make sense because you need to survive today to get to the medium but if you then just do continuous survival you're going to get in trouble so that's where the problem is so so it's not that it's the, the, the sometimes the short term things it's not that it is bad uh, because sometimes if you don't do that you can't get to the medium but in doing those short terms you must have a plan to get to that medium and how you are going to react in medium if that the that link is missing and that's where we get into trouble um just a little bit about banks and finances um are there pathway forward safe as it stands only a few comments if you can so i feel that it's like this in in, in any economy the live wire or the foundation or whatever you want to call it is the banking system because that's the one that finances businesses it's the one that moves uh, people who like savers money is into uh, industrial activity so it's that's the real uh, intermediation that takes place in the banking system the banking system has to be strong so uh, i i think our banking system is relatively strong it has some weaknesses here and there meaning i mean any banking system has uh, take america today everyone thought america is the the most safest place but see the the way the banks are falling like uh, i don't know it just like flies it keeps falling right so any banking system has those risks not that it doesn't because a lot of those risks emanate from the economics so so say for example i think covid highlighted some of those risks and that's why some of these cannot survive the covid uh, disaster mm -hmm. but no one planned for a disaster like covid right i don't think anyone's planning cycle had that they will talk about uh, you know uh, we will have uh, emergency plans and all those things but never in, in anyone's wildest dreams did they think a situation like this will happen uh, you know there will be no movement of people for a couple of years uh, were never factored in so so when this happened a lot of people were struggling as to how to overcome it so you have to you know have uh, uh, that 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 whole process of planning and trying to figure out the future what are the options available what are the things that could happen and what would your response be if those things do happen 
uh, is something that all businesses have to continuously uh, work on, uh, which will help them to navigate uh, difficult times. Yeah, the business continuity plans. <laughs> you, probably the last question would be, you've, you've, had, you've met many leaders, many CEOs. If you had to give them top three advice from your many years of experience, what would it be? So I think many businesses I have seen, uh, they, are, uh, they need a lot more improvement in their risk management skills. When I say risk management, people tend to think it's a book exercise. No, it's about what some of the things that I mentioned to you, you know, identifying what can happen. And what are the areas that, uh, if it does happen, which will not allow me to achieve my objective. So they, they have to go back to their drawing boards and figure this out. Now, a lot of, I have seen many companies doing this as a more mathematical or more uh, uh, book exercise. You know, they will do all these things, but it doesn't come out as a live scenario. Uh, the, the, the second thing I believe that businesses have to take cognizant of is the, this ESG. That, that's going to come into the world in a big way. Uh, because as I said, the planet I think is overcrowded. So we, have, we are utilizing resources more than what we should have. Replenishment of those resources are not happening in the pace at which we are utilizing them. So, so we need to uh, create that and, and increasingly in that whole ESG, that's the environmental part. Then there is the social part. Uh, there is a lot more pressure uh, about hum humanity, basically uh, how they work, working conditions, a lot of things like that is going to come. So that social part is also going to come. Then how you interact with communities? Uh, are we are we making profits at the expense of uh, uh, of the communities? So so the, that's the whole stuff is come and then the governance part. I think the the key feature going forward will be as I say, risk management, ESG, and better governance. Uh, a lot of people misunderstand this word governance, uh, in my view. Uh, we get into what I call micromanagement uh, and then that's a good thing and a bad thing. When you get into micromanagement, the next layer assumes that there is always a safety net. But that overall uh, oversight layer doesn't work. So these have to happen uh, in, in some form and uh, uh, Sri Lankan uh, the ones that businesses that I have seen and watched, uh, there are companies which are to be admired that they are moving towards that. But I, I don't think we have, none of the entities have really achieved that. Uh, we are in that path of getting there. Uh, to achieve that, we need to use things like AI, we need to use data, we need to do a lot of things, uh, which is not happening because uh, one part of it is a lot of businesses think that this is a cost. Unfortunately, initially it is a cost because for you to invest in people, for you to invest in uh, processes, uh, whether you are investing in uh, you know, technology or whatever it is, it's a cost. But the, that's where I think we are not really looking at the whole holistic picture. Yes, cost is there, but then there has to be a specific objective that you are trying to achieve also. Then you can justify the cost. But sometimes we are achieving the, we are we are putting in cost, because either the market is doing it, or we will not be competitive. But really, doesn't have business case. Okay. <laughs> so cost is fine as long as you have a business objective and a business case, sure. and how you are going to recover that cost. Absolutely. So you are two weeks into retirement. How does it feel, and what's your next game? <laughs> Many people ask me this question. Uh, after two weeks, uh, unfortunately, my activities hasn't slowed down, uh, okay. meaning I, I, I don't necessarily go in the morning to earn and young as it were, uh, to work, but, but at the moment I have various other things which is like the, my responsibility to the institute, uh, then I'm on the SEC at the moment, uh, the, the, they are dragging me into various things. So, uh, sometimes wondering whether I have really retired because I, my retirement I expected to, you know, maybe get up a little late <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, have a rest in the evening and everything, but that hasn't happened. <laughs> so, I still am out, out at the normal time and, and, and uh, if you ask my wife, she says, I am still back at late in the night. <laughs> <laughs> that has changed, but I am I, hoping that it will yeah. since uh, in the next few, uh, because it's too early in the cycle. Uh, 
hopefully i will uh, sort of uh, cut down a bit and uh, maybe uh, take it easy uh, yeah. because uh, as i said 40 years i have done this jo- uh, thing and if you really look at it if you take my full life cycle two thirds of my cycle has been in working <laughs> so so uh, uh, hopefully to change yeah and moment. we wish you the same as well manil it has been lovely having you a um, lot of good discussion um value that you've created in the minds of many of our listeners i think retirement is a word that um, you can take it easy but you have too much of knowledge and too much of value as a son of sri lanka to ever retire uh, i only wish you all the very very best um for all the good work that you do so thank you so much for being with us thank thank you very much nirushan for giving this opportunity and uh, i hope it will be useful to our uh, the audience as such i'm sure it will be thank, thank you, you so thank much you.